Okay, recording, stand by. I'm going to start the live stream. Stand by. Okay, you're streaming live. Hello, everyone. I wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening. Welcome to this fun virtual debates 2020 scrimmage for today. This is the final debate of the 16 rooms of a double elimination tournament, which has used the Zoom virtual platform. Our host today is Fred Becker, who will be managing the technical aspects of our match. Our judges are Tanya Sienko, Maggie Berthium, and Phyllis Redhead. Tanya Sienko is the CEO of Prairie Nanotechnology, is skilled at patent law, marketing strategy, trademarks, venture capital, and speaks six languages. Maggie Berthium is the director of debate at Woodward Academy in Atlanta, GA, where she's coached a number of state and national champions. A graduate of Dartmouth College, Maggie competed in interscholastic debate herself before moving into teaching and coaching. Phyllis Redhair is a sp space flight and exploration advocate with NSS, having served five years and is currently president of the Phoenix chapter of NSS and acting executive secretary for the National Space Society Chapters Assembly. And I am the timekeeper and facilitator for this final debate in Zoom Room 16, and my name is Apurva. I would like to read the following statement to you. The winning team is chosen based on their skill and effort and not on any preset NSS position. NSS clearly believes that humanity should continue to explore, develop, and settle space. However, NSS also believes that open, honest debate will facilitate that goal. It is important that space advocates understand and be able to express the anti-space case. No statement made by any debater or coach is an official position of the NSS. Let's meet our debaters. Team Atlas, please give us your name and country of origin, please. Hello, I'm Ivana Popa and I'm from Romania. I'm the speaker one and two for Team Atlas. Nice to meet you all. Hi, I'm Anthony Zhang. I was born in America. I'm Chinese American and I'm gonna be speaker three for today. Hi, I'm speaker four for Team Atlas. My name is Andre Marin and I am from Romania. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Team Atlas. Team Super Heavy, please give us your name and country of origin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Abhinaya, I'm from India. Good morning, Mandal. My name is Jishika and I'm from India and I'm Indian. Hello, my name is Andrei. I'm from Romania and I'm a Romanian. Good morning, my name is Ryan Grizzard. I'm an Asian American and from Florida. Thank you, Team Super Heavy. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand in your participants icon. Please mute your mic unless you're speaking and only the presenting team and judges should turn on their videos unless directed by the moderator. Here is our format for our debate today. Each member of Team Atlas will speak for two minutes taking the affirmative position. I will let the speaker know when two minutes is reached. After the affirmative eight minutes, Team Super Heavy, each speaking for two minutes, will give their negative arguments. After hearing their arguments, our host will open the breakouts for five minute conversations for teams to prepare their summary and the judges to confer. The breakouts will close and the affirmative side with only one person speaking from Team Atlas will present their three minute summary. I'll indicate when your time limit has expired. Finally, one person from the negative side, Team Super Heavy, will present their three minute summary and I'll indicate the time limit if needed. If there is time, the judges may ask a question of the teams. The questions may be answered by any and all members of the team. The judges will use their second breakout to discuss their findings and determine the match winner. After 10 minutes, the judges will return to the common Zoom room to give their feedback and decision should time allow. We have a hard debate session stop at 11.15 a.m. CDD for this room. All right, Mr. Becker, do we only have the judges and affirmative team Atlas with live video and mics, please? Yes, we're good to go. Thank you. Let's get started. We'll hear from the first speaker from Team Atlas, representing the affirmative position for Resolution B, the gateway will be critical in expanding human presence to the moon and deeper into the solar system. Team Atlas, your first speaker may begin. 
The Lunar Gateway is a four-person space station projected to be situated in lunar orbit, where it will support other space missions, ease communications in space, and perform scientific experiments. We consider it critical for short-term exploration, involving expanding human presence on the Moon and even further in the solar system. By short-term, we refer to the next 25 years. We define human presence as permanent habitation of a celestial body or space settlement. This makes sense because visiting the moon over 40 years ago does not make us present there. This objective brings us significantly closer to universalization, as a space colony or settlement would be an outpost of the human species as a whole. Nowadays, space exploration is conducted by agencies in cooperation with private companies, and achieving promising results would encourage more countries to participate. Therefore, our first contention is that the gateway is important for developing a permanent base on the moon and going beyond it. This is how NASA, by choosing not to include it in the first phase of the Artemis program, considered it. Doug Lovero, NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations, declared for SpaceNews.com in March 2020 that by postponing the gateway, we will be able to create a better one. This proves that the gateway is critical in a more advanced phase of space exploration. Indeed, when going to Mars, an intermediate stop on the moon would require more fuel for escaping its gravity. The gateway allows us to bypass the moon, thus being critical for reducing overall costs. The next step after the gateway is the deep space transport system, which will help us develop a permanent presence in other regions of the solar system. As NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Missions Mission Directorate presented in 2017, this vehicle will depart from and return to the gateway, which is integrated in a broader image of space exploration, then simply returning to the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 2 from Team Atlas, you may begin. There has not yet been a decision regarding how we should use the moon. This decision involves political considerations regarding our right to intervene and alter its natural environment, requiring global consensus. This makes it a very good example of applied universalization. Our second contention is that the gateway allows us to explore the moon without irreversibly altering it. And it's also safer for the astronauts, reducing the failure rate of future missions. Of course, we can imagine ourselves reaching the moon without a gateway through a highly ambitious direct project. However, this works only on paper, while the reality is much more complicated. When talking about little unpredicted bad events in war, Karl von Clausewitz called their accumulated effect friction. This metaphorical friction works in space exploration too, as NASA moon mission fact sheets show that over 40% out of more than 100 global missions to the moon failed. So we clearly need to increase the success rate if we want to involve more people in lunar exploration and achieve a universal satellite. One way to increase the success rate is by improving communications in deep space. And guess what? According to ISA and NASA, that is one of the most important purposes of the gateway. A better approach would be to send periodic missions to the moon from the gateway. Using both humans and robots, we could build a base before actually sending its first residents in space. For the exploration phase, prior to building a settlement, a team from the University of Arizona argued in an article published in March 2019 that we could launch and coordinate CubeSats designed to gather information about the geology of our satellite. This will help us find the spots rich in resources that could be used in a colony, and we will later use the gateway to access them. The Apollo mission has a limited part of the moon from landing, but the gateway helps us land almost anywhere on the moon, being critical for reaching the best spots for human missions. Now, Anthony will explain why, why a moon base won't be better than the gateway. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 2. Speaker 3 from Team Atlas, you may begin. Our third contention is that we are not yet ready for any project more ambitious than the Lunar Gateway, including any project of a permanent moon base. First of all, as Robert H. Lewis argues in the 1992 NASA Space Resources publication, Volume 4, a moon colony must be protected from ionizing radiation and thermally insulated, so it has to be built underground. This base will require technical equipment to be shipped from Earth, and without the Gateway, this is a truly expensive task. Secondly, a lunar colony would ask for permanent expansion, as many people might be interested in becoming lunar colonists. 
This will both be expensive and unproductive. Similar to the terrestrial gold rushes, a competition for lunar resources will delay universalization and affect the lunar environment. Moreover, we should test the large number of technical operations and production facilities involved in developing this colony in lunar conditions before commencing to the colony itself. The Gateway allows us to send astronauts to the moon more often to perform such experiments. Simply said, a moon base is hardly feasible right now. Any accident that happens on the moon may be tragic, and it takes several years to go there from Earth. Because the Gateway is situated in outer space, outside any significant gravitational force, it would help us immediately reach the moon. You can think about the Gateway as having a double role, of shelter on the way to other bodies and, fire, and firemen available to help if something goes wrong. Our point is that a gateway capable of reducing the overall risk when thinking of mass-based transportation, as the future permanent moon base will require. Doug Libero, already cited in our first argument, also indicated that, that, that the gateway, gateway will be safer and cheaper than expected, as its two main modules will be assembled on Earth and launched with a single rocket. As its two main modules will be assembled on Earth and launched with a single rocket, so construction in an orbit is no longer a problem. As you can see, the Gateway is much more cheap, efficient, and helpful than any alternative, being undeniably critical for future space exploration. Now here's Andre to explain how the Gateway increases universalization. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 3. Speaker 4 from Team Atlas, you may begin. Our fourth contention implies that the Gateway is one step from a series of space settlements that will expand human presence in deep space, contributing to a more universal space. The Gateway is welcomed as a hub for resources, including fuel, to flow not only between the Moon and Earth, but towards deep space too. This will make space exploration more accessible, thus more appealing for agencies on Earth. For example, participating in the construction of a module for the Gateway or in its maintenance is much more cheaper than launching a mission on your own. We consider that the universal space is accessible for a large variety of equipment. The near rectilineal Heller orbit of the Gateway is the best compromise between a high orbit, very accessible from Earth, and a low orbit, beneficial for landing on the Moon, as an IEEE Spectrum article from July 2019 states. The Gateway will act as an elevator, indispensable for reaching the Moon with many landing modules. Thus, not building the Gateway means that we, we have to rely on a few number of models of lunar lander, limiting the development in this field. Therefore, we can think of the Gateway as an investment where developing countries afford to participate in multinational initiatives. This will make space exploration more popular among those states, raising the overall space awareness among people on Earth. Any other approach to space exploration is more ambitious and consequently more expensive and risky. A universal gateway where countries truly cooperate ensures a fair distribution of resources, helping us achieve equity in space affairs, rather than a monopoly led by several countries. Nonetheless, its research potential, exemplified by studying cosmic radiation and also the lunar surface, as presented before, will also be universal. This is why the gateway is critical. Beyond economic and technical aspects, there are significant social and scientific outcomes creating an opportunity we simply cannot overlook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker Four. Thank you, Team Atlas. Now it's time to hear from Team Super Heavy, <clears throat> representing the negative position. Do we only have the judges and negative Team Super Heavy with live videos and mics, please? Yes. Thank you. So speaker one from Super Heavy, you may begin. Respected jury, coaches, spectators, and my fellow mates, a very good morning, afternoon, evening to one and all present here. Our team will be telling you about economics management, gateway sustainability, astronaut's health, and NASA's skepticism. The gateway is not critical while its cost may be astronomical. According to Gerson Meyer, a NASA aerospace engineer, the total cost of the ISS was $150 billion, and the cost for every person on the ISS was $7.5 million per day. And the gateway is much further from the Earth than the ISS, and with the help of NASA historian Leonard Bruno, we found that Polo's cost was approximately $109 billion. According to NASA strategist Melanie Whiting, a mission to the Moon is about 1,000 times further from Earth than missions to the International Space Station. 
So the cost of maintaining the lunar spacecraft will be a lot bigger than maintaining the ISS. Not only the components will cost a lot, but also the cost of the launch and placing the spacecraft in the lunar orbit will be astronomical. Jordan Evans, NASA operation manager, says the total minimum delta V to send a spacecraft to the moon, then to Mars, is 7.7 kilometers per second which is 102% more energy than is needed to simply send it directly to Mars. This is something that goes against the concept of universalization because it will, it will be a waste of resources which can otherwise be spent in the world to keep our planet from dying. According to SpaceX.com, they are already preparing rockets known as Starship for the Mars missions. This makes the Mars mission even more sustainable as SpaceX has fantastically proven just this last weekend. So a mission journey to Mars would be more justified, while it doesn't take so many resources, it's less expensive, showing a respect for our, for our humanity called universalization. So the gateway won't be critical in expanding the human presence to the moon and deeper into the solar system when other missions are more favorable. And now, Abinaya. Thank you. Thank you, Team Super Heavy. Thank you, Speaker 1. Speaker 2 from Team Super Heavy, you may begin. A moon base rather than a gateway would serve as the first step towards ensuring the long-term survival of the human race, towards exploring and colonizing further reaches of the universe, something necessary for humanity's existence called universalization. According to Professor Mathis Pearl, a moon base would provide a foundation to improve our spaceflight technology and improve our knowledge about the lunar surface. There's a potential of using lava tubes and tunnels formed during the moon's volcanic past as shelters with access to frozen ice beneath the surface. According to science journalist Sarah Fest, the moon harbors many mysteries, including how it's formed. Michael Duke, the director of the Center for Space Resources, states a lunar research base allows scientists to explore the moon's lava tube caves, look for signs of geologic activity, and investigate hints of water ice found in the craters of the lunar poles. Space.com's editor-in-chief, Tarek Malik, says a lunar research base would give NASA expertise in engineering and operating life support system, a sustainable energy source, ways of supplying food and recycling water. This could help start a sustainable life in space. And even a few of these methods could help solve problems on Earth, which is all the universalization. Aerospace analyst Jeff Faust believes the gateway's focus only reduces our chance of reaching the moon by the year 2024. Transferring the components to the lunar orbit from the Earth, the gateway's assembly demands substantially more energy and resources. This dramatically increases our financial expense risk and danger. Components may fail to be delivered and accidents become drastically more fatal due to the distance from Earth. Are we ready to take such a risk? No, we are not. So, the gateway is not critical for expanding human presence into the solar system. And now, Rishika will explain more about astronaut health. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 2. Speaker 3 from Team Super Heavy, you may begin. The lunar gateway is a bad idea. There is no need for one, and it makes neither financial nor scientific sense. According to Lawrence Yang, some astronauts returning from long stay on International Space Station must be carried out of the landing capsule because their muscles have atrophied even if they have exercised. According to Kennedy Space Center, the gateway will have only 12.8 feet, so it won't have much space for sports equipment. A lunar base wouldn't allow them to exercise better as we don't want them to have muscle problems. A moon base can also be similar to our na natural habitat so that longer running experiments can take place including more people with different jobs. The gateway will only house four astronauts stating for 30 to 60 days. By passing the gateway and establishing a lunar base requires a diversity of people and their talents, an example of universalization. According to the AMC Research Center, the Lob G will have a nine month of period of autonomy. Ryan will explain more about the needlessness of the autonomous of the autonomous gateway. According to Scott Smith, manager for nutritional biochemistry, a lunar base can protect those inside it from radiation better as it has phytoplastic material. And ISS study showed that the microgravity environment in the gateway can have deleterious effects on organisms like cardiovascular and musculoskeletal changes, neurovestibular adaptation, immune dysfunction, and delayed injury healing. So the gateway won't be critical in expanding the human presence to the moon and further into space, bringing a lot of risk for our health with a lunar base dozen. And now Ryan will continue. Thank you. 
Thank you, Speaker 3. Speaker 4 from Team Super Heavy, you may begin. To conclude our debate, as the fourth speaker, I will explain how and why Gateway is redundant and therefore not a critical program. NASA's ambiguous plan for the Gateway is unjustified as it offers less than typical space station at a much steeper cost. NASA's expensive and unjustified plans for this project is not critical. Referring back to my colleague's argument that this station only offers four astronauts at a time while having the same practicality as a large satellite or rover at an extreme price. According to a report done by Chelsea Gove, a science correspondent for Space News, NASA itself has even removed Gateway from its critical path to get to the moon by 2024, proving to be, for Gateway to be unfeasible and unnecessary. Although the Gateway program has been reinstated in the past few months, it has been on a shaky path from the start and has been very controversial for NASA, being bounced back and forth because of the divided consensus in NASA. Also, rovers and lunar reconnaissance orbiter satellites are already orbiting eccentric parts of the moon and scouting for future robotic and human missions on the moon. If anything, Gateway only stands in the way of furthering space exploration deeper into the solar system, as it will take extra time, manpower, and an extra $30 billion in funds. Even NASA officials have stated that creating a lunar outpost or base would be more cost effective and more critical to exploring the moon than creating a space station orbiting at a similar cost. Not only does the gateway go against the way of progress towards colonizing the moon, it also goes against the universalization as a waste that could a waste of resources that could benefit humanity in other ways, as it does not consider the lunar environment. Overall, NASA's uncertain plans for the Gateway project is unjustified due to the fact that countless rovers, satellites, and astronauts already contribute the same attributes that Gateway is promising to do for less resources and time. Therefore, Gateway is not a critical program for further space and moon exploration. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker 4. Thank you, Team Super Heavy. We'll now ask Mr. Becker to open the breakouts for five minutes to prepare team summaries and the judges to confer. Please join the breakout rooms. While we wait for our debaters and judges to come back, can I request everyone to turn on your videos and mics, please? So while we wait, um, I'd just like to talk about how the debates have progressed from last November. 35 students were selected from 76 applicants for this fun virtual debates 2020. The steps to get to this point involved a robust application process, an online course, and dedicated time with their coaches who hailed from Seoul to Korea to Massachusetts in US and to India. This 2020 process alone has resulted in the contribution of over 1,550 student hours in the study of space policy and universalization. I'd like to ask Dr. Edmonds and Mrs. Delutri on what's your reaction to these numbers? So I guess I should start since you mentioned my name first. Um, first of all, congratulations to the debaters who are now uh, um, fiercely working on their rebuttal, which is quite fantastic. But I think what you're seeing today is exactly that extensive investment on the part of coaches on Francis at Perva and Suvik and our, our, our everybody involved in the vision of NSS to have this event just showcases the extensive contribution of these students and the quality of the debates that we're seeing today. And I think what it really underscores is that universalization in the concept of space development is them thinking about the technical aspects as well as the human values and the return on investment as humans for underscoring the imperative in this frontier that we have an inclusive and cooperative agenda for its development. But secondly, that I think what you're seeing is a lived experience, that these students are living that environment, the international environment, the time zones, and all of those complexities of how you actually work cooperatively in a debating environment to produce really quality debates today, which is what we're seeing. And I can't thank the group together for all of the collective investments that we're seeing today. It's a really fantastic accomplishment. And um, what more can I say? It's, it's a momentous day for NSS and all involved. When we started looking at the numbers of student hours and educator hours to bring off these debates, it was pretty astounding. I um, have often thought if um, we had not gone completely virtual, what would those numbers be? 
I think they would probably have been quite similar because of the commitment of the coaches and organizers and uh, students themselves. Um, this uh, program is beyond an individual school. It's beyond an individual country. It is a personal commitment to finding out more about what it takes to live and work in space. These uh, students that were involved had also been involved in a competition at NSS called um, Space Settlement Design Competition. So within their own schools, they had worked together to design a habitat to live in in space. And the idea was they would go to the conference in Dallas, which was uh, canceled in uh, late May, uh, to present their findings. And so uh, we used the same audience to uh, craft together the uh, debate teams. So now this debate team, this debate, debater is uh, without the support of their individual school. There is no teacher behind saying, you must do this and you must do that. Uh, your grade depends on this or that, but rather it was a personal commitment to put um, their best foot forward and to also learn about other cultures and languages and um, just other ideas and also how to tackle some pretty difficult resolutions. And the idea of the time spent is um, overwhelming, but I think the final product is just astounding. I, I couldn't be more pleased. Thank you, Port. Yeah, it's pretty I'd like amazing. Yeah, I'd like to echo Francis and LJ when I say it's a very rewarding experience to watch all of these students compete. And even with the setbacks we had due to COVID, the commitment these kids have shown is truly fantastic. So Coach Voss, uh, you have been involved with the SPUN debates for the last two years. Can you share with us your thoughts on the evolution of the debates and how you hope they will be developed in the coming years? Uh, yes. Uh, so i very pleased with the development year over year. I think that the quality of the debates that I've seen this year uh, really blows me away. Even, you know, I know we're, we're watching the final debate now, but the debates prior have been very competitive. The students have done very well. Uh, and, I, and I think that, that really just goes back to the amount of, uh, echoing Francis here, the, the amount of time that they've dedicated to their craft. In terms of where we go moving forward, uh, one kind of small thing to uh, discuss is that we are looking at branching out into a college and university uh, division to these debates as well. That was on the table for this year, but uh, was parked as a result of uh, COVID-19 based concerns. But there is a robust college and university circuit for uh, debate. And, and so we are hopeful that we will be able to, in future years, bring those students into the fold as well. Aperva, can I just make a, another comment? Sure. I just want to underscore that what this debate has showcased is that you can compete using a, an inclusive and cooperative approach. The competition is not, uh, doesn't underscore the lack of your ability to cooperate and mutual respect. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this has been a very important feature of this particular debate and is at the heart of the content on the construct of universalization, that everybody has a voice and everybody needs to be listened to and everybody has an equal role to participate. And I think that's what you see by this whole process is these students have learned that you can compete, but compete with mutual respect of everybody's engagement and role, and that the outcome of the decisions and the debate is far superior than if they didn't work in this kind of an environment. So it really is an important, I think, contribution to the debate uh, construct itself. Yep, that is definitely true, LJ. And I think the word we have been uh, subtly using is cooperation, which I think is yes. a fantastic word. For yeah, that's <laughs> what we created. Yeah, cooperation is the, is the new world order. That's right. And um, yeah, it's a very exciting time. It really is. And I, I must say, it's a celebration of these students of what they can achieve. I mean, they contribute just as well to space policy as anybody else. That's how good they are. Thank you very much, Ajay. Looks like our uh, debaters and judges are back. We're now ready to hear the summaries. I'd like to request everyone to turn off your videos and mics, unless you're the presenting team or the judges. 
Thank you. Now, Team Atlas, representing the affirmative position, please give us your three-minute summary. You may begin. We will concentrate our final speech on proving that our arguments are more relevant and feasible than the arguments of Super Heavy. The other team made in their first argument a comparison between the gateway and the ISS. The ISS was constructed in the 1990s, and since then, the technology has advanced so much that we cannot compare these two projects. The cost for Falcon 9 and Dragon Cargo to transport a kilogram of freight to the ISS is 24% of the shuttle cost to the ISS, as shown by Harry Jones, NASA research analyst, in 2018. Also, NASA anticipates that the maximum contract award from all gateway services over the course of next 15 years will be valued at $7 million. Thus, it is a limited cost and won't get out of control. The lunar base, on the other hand, is a vague concept and people may ask to expand it permanently, consuming more money than the lunar gateway. In their second argument, the team Super Heavy argued that the moon base would be better than the gateway. But even if a moon base would be useful, it doesn't mean that the gateway won't be critical. Furthermore, as my teammate argued in their third argument, any permanent base won't be feasible right now. They talked about extracting resources from the moon. Are you sure this is even possible? We propose to test the technology before building the moon colony. The gateway allows us more often and longer space mission on the moon of 30 to 60 days, allowing us to perform any necessary test. They talked about risks, risks, about the fact that some components of the Lunar Gateway may not deliver properly. And they even asked if you are able to take that risk. But how are we about going directly to the moon? How would that not be risky? Over 40% of the missions to the moon failed. And since the Apollo mission, no human has gone to the moon. Moreover, a lunar colony without the gateway does not as bring closer to the universalization as it may be used by the country which build it only. On the other hand, the gateway is an universal project. Thus, it can be used only for universal missions as it will have international supervision. The other team had an entire argument related to how the gateway won't allow astronauts to exercise. This may be true, but the gravity on the moon isn't sustainably big. It's only 16% of the terrestrial gravity, so would also imply some physical changes on the astronauts. Also, the maximal time spent on the gateway is three months, according to the European Space Agency, while the average stage on the ISS takes six months, having a double duration. This drastically reduces the risks on astronauts, not allowing us to compare the two missions. In the end, we think that the gateway is critical for reaching Mars in reasonable conditions, so it is necessary even for the Mars exploration both teams supported today. This difference makes our approach better. Is it more prudent dimension? Thank you very much. Thank you, Team Atlas. Uh, team Super Heavy, representing the negative position, please give us your three-minute summary. The gateway won't be critical in expanding the human presence to the moon and deeper into the solar system. A mission directly to Mars would be more justified. Also, as my colleague Abinaz said, it is more efficient and economical just to build a lunar base, benefiting humanity more strategically, leading to universalization. The health risk can, can be considerably lowered if we replace the astronauts with robots, satellites, and rovers. While they get into the same thing because the gateway is orbiting and not landing on the moon and it is autonomous for at least nine months, as Ryan and Rushika said in their arguments. A lunar base would be just healthier for colonists. They could even have more space for sports equipment. Transport is frequently required because of short stays on the, on the gateway, so its cost will rise every month. Not only the building cost will be big, but also the cost of sending gas trucks every month will be huge for lodges, not autonomous period. We can do this without a gateway. At last, team have talked about the settlement in space. We're not even close to that. And also, in the NASA STTR 2020 Phase 1 solicitation, it says, the current concept of operations for Gateway anticipates uncrewed dormant periods of up to nine months. Technologies need to be capable of or enable long-term, mostly unsupervised, autonomous operations. While crew are present, technologies need to, needs, needs to augment the crew's abilities and to allow more autonomy from Earth-based mission control. Speaker 1, 2, and 3 said it will, it will help us to get to the moon faster and to create a moon base easier with the help of the gateway. How are you going to get to the moon, as you said? It will take a lot of time if you do the gateway mission, as Abina said in her argument. A lunar base is more justified, as I said earlier. 
This is oh, this also saves more energy, resources, and time. Something respectful called universalization. A lunar base would also be cheaper and more sustainable than the gateway, as it can use different resources on the moon, not like gateway, which takes all its resources from Earth. According to NASA.gov, the total cost of a moon base would only be $35 billion. Speaker 1 and 4 said it helps for collaboration between countries. Any other space program leads to collaboration between countries. And let's take the example of ISS. And a lunar base is more effective for cooperation, while some countries don't have money to make modules or parts for Gateway, but they can send useful tech or people to a lunar base colony. Most of the speakers of the affirmative team talked about Doug Lavero and the, that he said that the Gateway hasn't been removed from the critical path. False. Doug Lavero, NASA's Associate Administrator for Human Exploration Operations, actually explained the change at the meeting of the NASA Advisory Council Statistics Committee in May, not March. The Gateway would not be, would not be critical for uh, NASA's Artemis program for 2024. The Gateway itself is not mandatory to get to the moon initially. So we are taking the Gateway out of the critical path to go ahead and get to the moon. In an article of SpaceX website, it said, with large hypothetical storage model, Starship is capable of delivering significant amounts of cargo for research and to support robust operations on the lunar surface to enable a sustainable moon base. NASA announced Starship was eligible for the commercial lunar payload services initiative to deliver payloads between Earth and the moon and to enable humans Thank you, to Thank you, Team Super Heavy. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we have some time for the judges to ask questions. Teams, please activate your videos. You may confer in real time online to determine who should answer the questions. Remember, anyone and everyone on your team may answer a question. However, they may not return to the question after the team has ceded the floor. Just a gentle reminder to the judges, each team must be asked the same number of questions. Over to your judges. Yes, uh, well, we... We have one question, which is addressed, going to be addressed to both teams. Again, we would like both teams to speak about the costs of the gateway versus the alternative. So team one, <laughs> affirmative the costs, team. The costs of the gateway indeed include both building it and uh, resupplying it periodically. As astronauts can spend a really long time on that gateway, indeed, those uh, missions will have to commence periodically. But NASA considered this and wants a maximum value for that contract, that's $7 billion for 15, 15 years. This means they won't exacerbate these costs more than it should be, and they have a plan for that. On the other hand, building a lunar colony implies a large amount of equipment, both for constructing it, even with lunar materials, and for uh, starting technical operations there. We need to be ship this equipment from Earth, as we do not have factories on the moon yet. Moreover, the gateway is somehow a concept which allows only a limited expansion. When we build the gateway, we know exactly what does it consist of, what models does it have, we know what models could we add. We know how much this would cost. On the other hand, building a lunar colony would ask for permanent expansion. We build a module, let's build another one, and so on, because there is a lot of room on the moon, and of course, there are a lot of uh, resources available. And this could make cost uh, get out of our control. If any of my teammates would like to add something, please. Covered almost everything. Well, construction in lunar environment, especially underground, like drilling into a lava tube and building a lunar base there, is extremely difficult and out of our reach um, as of now. Building a lunar gateway first before we build a lunar base would be much more beneficial because it would make it a lot easier. Thank you. Uh, negative team? Yeah, sure. Team? So, as the speaker Andre said in the Atlas team, a moon base can be very uh, productive for our, for ourselves, for the humanity. While it had, we have a lot of space there, we have a lot of resources there. So he agreed um, a moon base could be good. Let's just say how much, and he also said the astronauts will need to be carried once. So he said astronauts can, can stay on the 
Lunar Gateway out of time, which is false, as Yoshika said in her argument. Um, we've lost you. We've lost your... You're muted, Andre. Oh, sorry. So, uh, at, in the Team Atlas, Andre Marine said, we have a lot of space on the moon base, and that we, can have, that we have a lot of resources on the moon base. So he agreed a moon base could be just favorable for us. Right? If we just make the maths and see how much a moon base costs, and then the gateway, we will see the moon base is kind of economically better for us. But if we do the both ones, just just think how much money this could be this we, we could spend for that. And he also said astronauts can stay a long term on the lunar gateway, which is kind of false because according to Rishika's argument, according to Scott Smith, they can only stay 30 to 60 days. So the cost will increase every month while new astronauts need to come to the gateway and those astronauts need to go, go to the Earth. And let's just think about the fuel. She also said in his argument that the gateway uh, can be a fuel point. Where are you going to take your fuel point to refuel other stations from the Earth? That's also a lot of money, more. So the cost can increase. Uh, Ryan, if you want to add something, please. Um, yeah, basically, um, the lunar base would be uh, more economically uh, efficient, as Andre said, but also building a gateway would be uh, more against universalization as it is a waste of resources, and it's only around like 12.8 feet long, so it's not a necessarily efficient refill point. It's much better and more efficient to build upon the lunar surface. Thank you. Uh, judges, do, do we have one more question? I think we have no, that was it basically what we had. Okay, then we'll ask Mr. Becker to open the breakout rooms for the judges to determine the winner. And teams, if you get sent to the breakout room, please stay in the main room, please. I'll come back. While we wait, can I ask all the debaters to turn on your videos and mics, please? Let's have a short discussion. Uh, here we are, anxiously awaiting what the judges will tell us. Let's all take a deep breath. Know that you have all done an outstanding job. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a moment to congratulate your preparation, commitment, and finally your presentations today. Team Atlas and Super Heavy dedicated over 330 student hours to arrive at this point. Let's give some applause to these extraordinary efforts, guys. Fantastic effort. And you guys have done such, such, such a marvelous job today. Uh, I'd like to share some of your experiences with the viewers. I encourage you to raise your hand to join in on our conversation. So during the debates, you guys had two resolutions. Resolution A was money spent on space exploration is not justified when there are so many problems here on Earth that we need to solve first. And today you have debated resolution B, which is the gateway will be critical in expanding human presence to the moon and deeper into the solar system. So please tell us which of these two resolutions was easiest to prepare for. I think we can direct this question to, uh, yeah, sure, Ryan, go ahead. Oh, okay, so I'll just add. So basically for me, I think uh, resolution A was a lot easier for me as it was a very straightforward resolution. It was just talking, it was a lot easier to find uh, statistics and articles about how all the problems here on earth that we have to solve, like global poverty, hunger, and stuff like that. And it really opened my mind up to uh, a lot of uh, programs we have in space and a lot of pro problems we have here on earth. It allowed me to connect the two, and it was a really good experience for me overall to learn about both resolutions. Anybody else would like to add to that? Uh, yeah, Andre. On the other hand, I agree that you find information very easily for the first resolution. But I think that the real challenge was uh, discerning the important information from the less important information. And this was clearly harder for the first resolution, especially because there was so many information. And also we had to choose which are these terrestrial problems we want to solve. So uh, this was a pretty challenging uh, thing for me. Thank you, Andre. Uh, would anybody else like to add to that? Coaches, uh, what's your opinion on that? 
I, I guess I can uh, start off there. Uh, the resolutions are very different. Resolution A uh, is broad and theoretical <clears throat> and kind of a value-based uh, question about uh, prioritizing different problems, some a little bit more near-term in nature uh, and others more uh, you know, bigger picture. Resolution B, on the other hand, quite a bit more technical. Uh, and so for students coming in without a deep understanding of the gateway and its purpose, which I think was most students and certainly a lot of the coaches, um, before you could even begin to tackle the best arguments on either side of resolution B, you kind of had to understand how the gateway worked um, and that sort of thing. And so uh, I, I don't know that either was easier or better, but they were very different, which I really liked because they brought out different skill sets in the students. Mm -hmm. I have to say that um, the, the first uh, resolution was about um, is, is space exploration justified with so many problems here on Earth. And I think John is absolutely right. It had a very different um, feel about uh, the uh, conversation around the resolution. But I think working through that, the team got to kind of understand uh, the value system of each other, etc. And then when we tackled um, Resolution B, which is uh, arguing if the um, LOPG or gateway satellite is uh, a critical um, piece to have us move to further moon exploration and solar system exploration. It seemed like we had some um, fundamentals set up. So I, I, I like it that uh, Resolution A was um, uh, debated in the first um, eight parts of this debate, sessions of this debate, and then resolution B was. I think it gave people kind of an opportunity to get to know one another uh, through that process. So I, I like the way the layout was, um, and uh, but certainly it called on different skills, absolutely. Thank you, coaches. So I'd like to ask, I think we've heard from a couple of debaters here that they, they were on the wrong side, like they felt the gate was an excellent idea, but had to report on the negative side or vice versa. So I just like to, yeah, I don't know. Go ahead. Um, well, actually, I felt that the gateway was not necessary. And uh, I felt very comfortable when we played on the negative side. Um, and maybe that's why we won uh, all the matches we played as negative side. But today, uh, it was somehow very strange because um, I, I do not agree with the gateway and I had to uh, to convince the judges that we are and we are in favor of the gateway and yet I think that's uh, some of the most one of the most challenging part of uh, being in a debate that you have to argue something that you as a person don't really think and um, I really liked it. Yeah, thank you, Ivana. So it looks like we have our judges back, but before we move on to their comments, I just want to get a quick thumbs up, thumbs down from you guys and no further explanation needed. Uh, I just want to see which, how many of you actually think the gateway is important? If you think yes, just a thumbs up, otherwise a thumbs down, please. <laughs> This is a very diverse group and yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. So now I think we can hand over to the judges. I'd like to request that you please uh, share your feedback before announcing the winners. And everyone, please activate your videos, but mute your mics, please. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this was such a fun debate to judge. Um, I've gotten to judge quite a few of these debates and I thought this one was um, truly exemplary um, from both sides. I thought all seven debaters really supported their arguments well with evidence. Um, everyone's doing all of the great things um, for communication uh, in a virtual format like eye contact and gestures even though you're in front of a computer. Um, it, was, it was really nice to see um, such um, great debating from both sides. Um, we it was extremely close um, and we thought that um, both teams did a good job of answering our question. Um, I thought that was a, a great opportunity for you all to show depth of your understanding of the core question um, and just to make sure that everyone was on the same page about sort of what we're talking about and, and the various um, alternatives, which was really cool to see. 
um, as someone who didn't know a ton about the Gateway, you know, two weeks ago when I learned this was the topic, um, it has been such a pleasure to learn these questions um, and, and sort of see where things are at. Um, do other judges want to give comments and then I can announce the decision? Yes. Um, uh, first, I'd like to say I'm helping this competition um, is is wonderful opportunity for me and um, this has been really a fulfilling experience watching you kids. Um, I think both teams had some really great strengths. Um, Atlas, I love that you had really good listening. As, um, and both of you, I, both of you did really well. And I think uh, Super Heavy, I think your content was really good. Um, and this was a really uh, hard competition for me to judge. Uh, you're both amazing, you know, and I'm really glad to see you guys um, doing this kind of work, just a rising generation. You're working hard and I see your inspiration to grow and work to become young women and men of great strength. And I really wish you good um, success in your journey. Uh, I'm really proud of how both teams have worked today, and I think you both all should as well. Lost your mic. Oh, okay. I guess it's me to say the uh, the last bit here. Uh, yeah, again, I think you're all uh, extremely good. Um, I very much liked how uh, the let's see the affirmative team basically did the listening and picked up points and then basically uh, did the did a rebuttal. Um, uh, also some of the the uh, pieces of evidence that were that were provided, particularly the the gateway being in a particular orbit and that uh, orbit essentially being used as an elevator was a very nice touch. And um, Anyway, I'd like to see exactly what you guys are going to go do um, from here on in. <laughs> so anyway, that's my, those are my comments. And back to our, I guess, our first judge to uh, announce the winner. Yep. So drum roll, please. Any, <laughs> actually excited. <laughs> yes. So this was a very close debate um, and both teams did an excellent job. Um, but we determined that based on the strength of their responses to the other side, uh, the winner um, is Team Atlas on the affirmative. Um, we thought they did a particularly good job of making sure to respond to each of the negatives points um, in a very clear and organized fashion um, that made it um, great, uh, made it easy for us to evaluate their evidence and the overall strength of their arguments. Um, we thought that Team Super Heavy was awesome. Um, you did a really good job um, overall, but Atlas um, was slightly better on, on that core issue, which um, helped us decide the debate. Um, this was such a pleasure to participate in, uh, and uh, I hope everyone had a great time in the competition. Oh, back to whoever. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, LJ, would you like to say a few words? Oh, boy, I could say a lot of words. Let me just try and place this in context. Again, congratulations to the winning team, but congratulations to both teams, because you really are exemplary. And I think what you've done is you've given us hope about our future to see that inclusive cooperation is possible. It is a learned experience and you've really accomplished that. But let me just underscore um, the history again of this uh, visionary uh, debate that the NSS has, has taken on. When we started this, you know, people often ask me, like, what's this in connection between space policy and technology development and this universal concept of inclusive cooperation and in terms of humanity sustainability? And, you know, today, I think we're living it. If you look at the COVID and how we've realized as individuals, we live in a borderless world and that what we need is the universal response where we work together and we cooperate so that we save lives and that as a globe and as an individual, we get back to work, we get back to play and we get back to our communities in a way that we can thrive. And it, the only way we can do that is by working together. And it really does underscore the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals for a Universal Policy Agenda. And then yesterday, when I saw from space 
the Black Lives Matter picture. And I realized that, you know, that space is really what brings the universal awareness to all of the globe's issue to the individual so that we can all see it and realizes that it affects all of us. Just underscores that space is this next frontier where it is imperative that we have an inclusive and cooperative approach. And it's important to note that we don't have that right now. But as our next frontier, as our salvation, which space just might be, we need to underscore the importance of the space policy and universalization agenda. But also going back to my earlier comment that these debates and the quality of these students just shows you that we have hope that transformation is possible because this next generation, if they see inclusive cooperation as possible and as a way to make good policy that benefits humanity, whether it's on, in space or here in our hometown, what, what better future can we have? So I just, again, want to congratulate the debaters, the coaches, Francis, Akurva, and um, Suvik for their incredible, incredible contributions. The coaches for also being so equal and thoughtful in your response. NSS Vision. And I also want to just mention a shout out to Lynn Zielinski, who's also played an instrumental role in helping us navigate uh, the fun debates over the last couple of years. So thank you, everybody, for making this such an important part of history that we're experiencing today. So wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you very much, LJ, for your wonderful, kind, and very inspiring words. Now, congratulations to both Team Atlas and Team Super Heavy. You guys did such a marvelous job, and I personally feel like we have taken an important step in putting the thought in people on, you know, should we really go to space? Should we just agree with everything that's going on? And as the main goal of these debates was educational and I think you guys have done a very fantastic job of it. So congratulations to both the teams. Everyone please unmute your mics and let's have a round of applause for all the participants in today's fun debates. Many, many, many thank yous to the students, teachers, coaches, moderators, hosts, and most of all, the parents who have made these debates possible. I hope you enjoy the remainder of your morning, your afternoon, or your evening. Thank you very much for participating in the May tournament of the Spun Virtual Debates 2020. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Congratulations. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Great job.